All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, we haven't done a webinar like this before and we thought it would be beneficial to both existing providers and those who are looking to get started with Igenix. Um, during this webinar, we will cover what makes Igenix a preferred tick-borne disease testing lab, how to order testing, which tests to order and why, and how to read the results. At the end, we will have some time for some questions. So let's get started. Uh, why Igenix? We have been in the space, um, pioneers of tick-borne disease testing for over 30 years. Um, we started off in 1991. And Igenix believes in comprehensive testing by testing for several tick-borne diseases. This includes Borreliosis, which comprises of both Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever. And then Bartonella, Babesia, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Rickettsia, and with the current pandemic, we've been able to use our technology to test for COVID-19 as well. At Igenix, we offer panels, um, we offer panel testing, and this allows us to offer uh, multiple methods of testing within a, within a panel. So um, patients can uh, experience both direct and indirect testing methods on their samples. And these includes, include immunoblots, PCR, FISH, IFA, and more. Our immunoblots have been proven to be nearly twice as sensitive in two-tier testing, as two-tier testing, and um, they are our prize testing at the moment. Okay. Igenix is CLIA and CMS certified and licensed to perform testing in all 50 states, including New York. We are located in Silicon Valley and are a leader in the Lyme community, performing all testing on site, and our experience research and development team develops all testing in-house. Patients usually end up testing with Igenix well into their Lyme journey. Uh, due to the nonspecific nature of tick-borne disease symptoms, patients typically uh, find Igenix when all other avenues or reasons for their unexplained symptoms have been exhausted. Um, unfortunately, this is when diseases are in their chronic stage. And so testing, there are two ways patients find Igenix, um, either patient-driven or doctor-driven. This slide is a concise view of the patient journey. In both cases, patients experience symptoms the patient then does their own research online, orders a collection kit and takes it to their doctor to order testing for hygienics. Or the second way is where the patient visits their doctor once they've experienced symptoms. The doctor suspects a tick-borne disease or several tick-borne diseases, recommends hygienics and provides the patient with a collection kit. The patient then, then has their sample collected, usually blood as around 90% of our tests require blood. However, we do offer urine testing and other miscellaneous sample testing, such as tissue, cerebral spinal fluid, placenta, and more. Urine, urine collection can be useful when testing younger children or babies, as the collection method is non-invasive. Other than the test requisition form um, uh, that has to be completely filled out and the sample collected, um, it's important that the, um, at the patient or the doctor's office discusses with the lab um, who's going to be sending the sample. Uh, your patients are open to use whichever lab they'd like, and we do have a bl blood draw uh, lab locator on our website to make this easier. So once the TRF has been completely filled out, the sample has been collected, um, the patient, the lab, or the doctor, wherever the sample is being collected, they ship the sample to us and the paperwork. We offer a prepaid FedEx mailer for domestic shipping, and it usually takes around two days to get to us. Um, once we receive samples here, testing typically takes around seven to 10 business days to process, upon which we send results to the referring provider. And, um, Doctors can also sign up for our lab portal where they can access 
past results of theirs, anything from 2000, September 2016 onwards is available on the lab portal. So if you are an existing doctor and you have old results you want to um, you, you want to get a hold of, just sign up to our lab portal by emailing labportal at igenics.com and they'll set you up with an account. For new doctors, we can set you up once you've sent in a sample. And to billing. So for, for billing, um, Igenix does not accept insurance except Medicare Part B. However, we do offer courtesy third-party insurance filing for possible reimbursement. And that third-party insurance filing form is included in the collection kit or on our website. We try to offer competitive pricing. And one way we're able to do this is through our panels. Our panels take the individual tests and combine them into different combinations and severely discount them. This way you're able to do multiple tests and not feel the, too much of a pinch. Um, several organizations with grants and Lyme testing assistance and Lyme testing assistance programs um, are around. Uh, one of these organizations is LimeTap, and the best way to for patients to apply for Lyme testing assistance is by going on their website. Uh, patients can pay for their testing, or providers can choose to have a credit card and file, which we will bill monthly for any testing performed in the previous month. Okay. And something else I did want to add on is about our add-on testing. So we do keep samples for um, two months. And so if uh, you did a panel and then you realize there are some, a few additional tests that you wanted to perform, we still have the sample. There are some limitations. Um, we, we, can only keep the fish testing for Babesia and Bartonella for one month, as the whole blood is usually good for one month, unless you've had the slides prepared in advance for possible fish add-on. And the IgX spot test for uh, Lyme and Bartonella cannot be added on because we do need a fresh whole blood sample. And that's the only one that's collected in this green sodium heparin tube. And... You don't need to create an account to test with Igenix. So um, kits can be ordered by calling in, emailing customer service or through the website. We'll, we'll, an account will be set up for new providers once we receive the first sample. And at that time, we'll also verify that the provider's credentials. The test requisition form offers over 60 uh, individual tests. These are on page three of the test requisition form. I'm just going to share the requisition form now, if that may make it easier to follow. And um, as I mentioned before, these tests, uh, the individual tests on page on page three, have been combined into several panels um, to provide different combinations, and these can be found on page two of the requisition form. So. Let's take a look at this TRF. The first page is pretty administrative. It's um, basically for the patient to fill out their demographics, include their payment information. It's really important that they do sign the form. Um, it's even more important that the physician signs the form as testing can be held up if that's not signed. So the physician needs to complete their part and the drawing lab, and then we need the specimen collection information on the storage, when it was collected, and any other pertinent information. Our requisition form can also be found on our website, and it's also included in the kit. The second page lists the panels in an organized way. So we first begin with the line panels, our immunoblock panels, which Dr. Berscano will speak more about, are, um, are really a lot more sensitive and specific than the Western block testing. Um, so we first list the Lyme panels and then the tick-borne relapsing fever panels. And then we combine the Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever panels into um, testing into Borreliosis panels as um, it's prudent to test for TBRF if you're gonna be testing for Lyme. 
as both the cause by Borrelia, just different groups of species of Borrelia. Um, we then take the co-infection testing and combine it with the t uh, t um, Borreliosis testing into tick-borne disease panels. And these are, as they get more expensive, they get more in depth and more comprehensive. Uh, this is followed by the right hand column, which has the co-infection panels that don't include bor Borreliosis testing. And then we have the individual co-infections listed out with their panels. And finally, the third page is all the individual tests if you want to choose testing a la carte. I am now going to hand it over to Dr. Burskano uh, to go into further details on what, uh, what testing we offer and um, the test interpretations, how to order testing. Before I hand it over, if there are any um, any areas you want to go over again or feel like you could do with an in-depth webinar, uh, please let us know and we'll try and facilitate that. All right, everyone. Hi and welcome and thank you for signing into our presentation today. Um, I want to talk um, from a clinician's point of view to help you see why I've always seen Igenix as being the premier tick-borne disease lab. I mean, I've been using them since I guess the 1990s shows how old I am. Um, but it, there are a lot of reasons why people think of Igenix as the best. So I want to show you that now and also give you ideas on you know, how to judge what testing to do for your patients and how to interpret all that. So we'll get started by talking about when you wanna have a good test for your, your patients, good meaning, accurate, informative, the right kind of test. Basically, there are two important issues. One, which sounds kind of obvious, almost ridiculous, but it really isn't, I'll show you, is testing for the right pathogen. There's so many different infections that are infecting our tick-borne disease patients, and they all are very similar in clinical presentation. So if you don't test for the right pathogen, you get a negative result. You know, in the past, many people were tested by a non-specific lab, you know, a large box lab where they don't do much in-depth testing. Test came out negative, the doctor is uninformed, says, oh, test is negative, you don't have Lyme disease, and that's it. Well, they didn't test for the other things that can mimic Lyme disease. So I want to go over in detail testing for the right pathogens and why that's so important and give examples. And the second thing, obviously, you want to talk about test performance. You know, if you go to the trouble of ordering a test and um, choosing the right ones, if the test is not that accurate, then what's the whole point? So again, two important issues. One is the testing for the right pathogen. The other is the test performance. So we'll start testing for the right pathogen. We'll start with Lyme disease. You know, most Lyme patients, in my experience, are co-infected. Here's a study published in 2018 from Igenix. Over 10,000 patient samples were co collated from every different state. And overall, 37% or more were positive for Babesia. Collectively, about 60% had Borrelia, but the breakdown is almost 50-50, maybe 55-45, Lyme Borrelia and relapsing fever Borrelia. They say, wait a second. Almost 30% had relapsing fever, these, these tick-borne patients. I don't recall ordering those kind of tests, and I don't see people you know, hiking in the Rockies. Where is this all coming from? Well, I'm going to show you some pretty eye-opening and practice-changing um, data on that. A lot of patients had Bartonella, Anaplasma, Rickettsia, or Lichia. And when you look at the co-infection data, 40% had at least two pathogens. Some had three, four, even five pathogens were found in this group. Now, this is an overall sample of all the patients, including those who are tested for early disease. You know, my colleagues and I have been doing this for a long time. We see a lot of chronic, in fact, predominantly chronic patients, late stage disease. Almost all of them are, are, um, are co-infected. So this statistic of 40% is overall all the tests. But I think if you narrow this down to being um, the people with the more difficult chronic cases, long-standing disease, you'd find the co-infection percentage is much, much higher. So thinking about this, to just do a Lyme test in these chronic tick one patients is setting you up to miss a lot. Now let's talk about the Borrelia itself. Here's another study, 543 patients from all across the United States were tested. They had suspected Lyme disease, okay? They didn't suspect to have anything but Lyme. And sure, 32% were found to have antibodies to Lyme, but 22% had antibodies not to Lyme at all, but to relapsing fever Borrelia. And 7% had both. 
in other words, these were co-infections with two different Borrelia in the same patient. It's also not very uncommon as, as I've seen in practice. If you look at the California subgroup, um, the percentage of relapsing fever was even higher as you can imagine. So the bottom line here is, if you have a patient who presents as Lyme disease, you have to think of tick-borne relapsing fever. Now you're gonna to say to yourself, well, that's kind of screwy. I mean, number one, the patient wasn't in an endemic error for relapsing fever. And number two, they weren't having these high fevers with a crisis and then feeling well for a few days. And five to seven days later, it came back and having these obvious relapses. You know, that's the textbook description of relapsing fever. But the thing is, as this has shown, these are patients with suspected Lyme. This is one of many, many studies that we have documented. The patients presented as Lyme disease, even though they didn't have Lyme Borrelia, they had relapsing fever Borrelia. So my thinking is that this classic textbook relapsing, remitting illness that's been called relapsing fever, that presentation really may be the minority of cases, sort of like how many patients with real Lyme get Bell's palsy? Well, obviously it's not very many. So my thinking is that number one, this classic relapsing fever, relapsing remitting scenario is not that common. But on the flip side, presenting as Lyme disease, headaches, chronic fatigue, joint pains, migratory neuropathy, and so forth, that is in relapsing fever. And probably, at least by these data, the predominant presenting sign. So it goes back to what Studi said earlier. If you have a patient in whom you're considering Lyme disease, you really, really should remember this and test not just for Lyme Borrelia, but also for relapsing fever Borrelia. That's a big takeaway here. Let's go even deeper. If you're looking for Lyme Borrelia, well, there are a lot more than just one. Now on the left side, you see, <clears throat> excuse me, Borrelia B31. Well, what is that? B31 is a type strain of Lyme disease. It was from a tick isolate collected off the islands off of the East Coast of New York State and it was collected back in the late 1970s, again, from a tick, not from a human being. This is what's been cataloged as a type specific or type strain of Lyme disease. And it's what the FDA uses to validate the FDA approval for test kits. So any lab that uses test kits, and it's all the big box labs and most hospital labs, um, will base their Lyme disease test on this one strain of one species of Lyme Borrelia that was not even from a human being, it was from a tick. So now, not everybody um, got bitten by that one tick in New York State. And it turns out there are all these other species that are infecting American, United States, North American, even Central American patients. So if you have a lab again that's doing B31 testing only, you're gonna miss all these others. And that's one of the reasons why some people say, well, Lyme disease testing is very insensitive. You miss a lot of important cases. Years ago, Igenix went tried to get around that by adding not a tick strain, but a human strain. That's the number 297, and that's added to their Western blots. So right off the bat, a Western blot for Lyme disease at Igenix already is better than the standard things that are done at the big box labs and some hospital labs. But, you know, if you survey patients in North America who have Lyme disease, Lyme Borrelia, you find not just B. burdorferi B31 and 297, which is also known as Borrelia burdorferi senso stricto. You also find other species, Californiensis, Maonii, very common in the Midwest, Spomaniae, Valesiana. Now, Valesiana, Spomaniae, Avzelia, and Guinea, the ones on the bottom of all these eyes, <laughs> um, these are recognized as European strains. And the dogma has always been that these are not found in North America, they're only found in Europe. Well, that's absolutely not true. Everything from migratory birds to actual Lyme patients tested by these labs have been found that these are present in the United States, North American patients. Now, some of these patients did travel, but a lot of them did not. And the fact that these are found in migratory birds means that they're obviously found in mammals. And now we know that they're in patients too. So how do you do this? Can you go to LabCorp and say, I want to test for Borrelis filmaniae or Valley Sienna, they look at you cross eyed The only way you can do this is by getting the Lyme immunoblot that Igenix offers. I'll go into detail about what an immunoblot is a little bit later on. All right, so now we know that it's not just Lyme disease, Borrelia, it's tick-borne relapsing fever, Borrelia. Well, that's a whole topic. I can give a whole hour lecture just on that. But suffice to say that these have been found in 
all 50 states in the United States. It's not just, you know, the mountainous west. Now, same story as with Lyme disease. You go to a big box lab and you order a test for relapsing fever, tick-borne relapsing fever, you get Borrelia hermesii. Well, that is one of the common ones and it is one of the ones that can cause these relapsing remitting scenarios. But the test that they offer is a very low tech IFA test, very old technology dating back more than 50 years. And therefore, in our experience, it's really not that accurate. You can get a test for the other one called Borrelia miyamotoi. It's a relatively newly described species of Borrelia that some think are kind of halfway between Lyme Borrelia and relapsing fever Borrelia. But nevertheless, you can order a test for this but you have to specifically ask for it. And what you get is either an ELISA, which is really not that accurate because their ELISA, the big box ELISAs, is based on only one antigen. It's called GLPQ. It's like doing a Western blot looking for just one band. So a lot of cases are missed. Some labs also offer PCR from Yamoto, some of the bigger labs. And that PCR is also found to be very insensitive for a variety of technical reasons. But that's not the whole story. Look at these other ones, Tosicolite, Turacate, Texasensis, Coriace, Parkeri. These are well described as being present in the United States and in our so-called Lyme patients. Some of these even cause EM rash. Some of these are known to be transmitted within seconds of a tick bite. Some of these are well known to cause maternal fetal transmission. So these really have a lot of characteristics of Lyme Borrelia and very easy to think about it from a clinical point of view. You can confuse the two. So without getting testing for both groups of Borrelia and the subgroups, all the different species, you're going to miss this. How, you, how do you do this? Well, again, the only way you can get all this is with an imidablot that is offered by Igenix. How about Bartonella? Well, it's a very similar story. Every time I give a lecture on Bartonella, I have to up the numbers. It used to be said that there are about 15 species. Now they said 30 species. Now they're up to 40 species because I keep finding more of them. It's not just something that's a laboratory curiosity, but you find a number of different species in the sick patients. And like with Borrelia, there can be co-infections of different species of Bartonella in the same patient. So taking the cue from the great success of the Lyme immunoblot, Igenix developed immunoblots for Bartonella because how else are you going to find all these different species? What this immunoblot allows us to do is detect antibodies to pretty much the most commonly found symptomatic, symptom-causing species in, in humans. Um, and you get a result showing positive or negative. And the positive, if one of these four is present, Hensley, Quintana, Elizabethi, or Vinsonii, the test will further go and say this exact one was found. So you can get a positive and say just a Bartonella, uh, Bartonella species, which means it's still a positive test. Um, or you could say Bartonella Quintana, for example, or Hensley and Elizabethi. Um, so again, it's showing species if one of these four are present and will show co-infections likewise. So if you're going to do a Bartonella serologic test, this is the one to do. The technology for immunoblotting, um, by the very nature of what it's made of and how it's uh, created, makes it far more sensitive than any other serologic method um, that's currently available. And the fact that it offers this broad species coverage makes it unlike any other test you can get um, serologically. Igenix also is an expert on fish technology. What is fish? It's called the fluorescent in situ hybridization assay. This is a direct test that's not like PCR that looks for DNA. This is a direct test that looks for the RNA. And the interesting thing about this is they take a drop of blood and they put it on the slide and they stain it with a specific probe that. Um, latches onto the specific RNA you're looking for and then fluoresces. So they use a microscope to scan the slide and actually see the organisms in the blood or in the blood cells or in the tissue, whatever test you're doing. Um, and you can directly see it there. Now this test has been found clinically to be more sensitive than even a PCR for Bartonella. And as many of you know, if not all of you know, Bartonella is a very difficult organism to pick up. And it's sometimes it lives in tissues and you're not going to find a positive blood test and you have to do another positive direct test. You have to do a serology. Sometimes the species are immunosuppressing or have been hidden from the immune system and you don't really find much serological response, but you can find them in the bloodstream using the fish test. Um, the other thing about the Bartonella fish, it's designed to detect 
them at this genus level, not species, but genus level. So it'll say Bartonella is present. And that way it's much more broad. It's not just for Hensley A.O. Quintana, it's for all the Bartonella. Um, now the other thing which is huge about a fish test, not just Bartonella, but all fish tests, is that it can detect organisms even if they're hidden in biofilms. That's not something that PCR has ever been detect, able to uh, been proven to do. Now we know that Bartonella is a huge maker of biofilm. I've actually seen blood smears um, from patients with Bartonella where you find the organisms floating in the bloodstream and not in cells. Like people say, oh, it's always within red cells. Well, no, we see them free swimming, but embedded in biofilms. Now you would not be able to detect this from PCR, but you will do it by fish because fish will detect biofilm residents. Now the PCR and the IG IGX spot, which is a T cell assay, um, these likewise are designed at Igenix to detect the, the Bartonella at a genus level. So once again, if you have a positive PCR for Bartonella, um, you know that it's a good result that it's just because it's identified to what species, a positive is a positive. The IGX spot is a T cell assay. What they do is they have T cells that are primed for whatever organism you're looking for. Patient's blood is, um, is exposed to the test. And if the T cells have been sensitized to um, the organism, the patient's T cells, what happens is it starts to produce interleukin and they can detect that. So the T cells in the patient, they're primed for the illness. In other words, it's been exposed to the pathogen and they have the memory for that, this test will pick it up, which is interesting because it's an indirect test that does not rely on B cells or serology. So you can have someone who's seronegative, but T cell positive. And that's very interesting because to me, that means there's something wrong with the patient's immune system. So the genius of this is if you do something very, very, effective like an immunoblot, which is basically a B cell type of test. And they had a T cell based test like the IGX spot. And one's positive, but the other one is not. Then you know that one of these two arms of the immune system is not functioning well. And this is obviously something we always are concerned about in tick-borne disease patients, because we know these illnesses can be immune suppressive. So by doing the test, you get a lot of information, not just on the organisms, but also on the immune system. Babesia, same story, multiple species. Um, the lab offers serology, IgM and IgG to both micro Babesia microti and Babesia duncani. Not all labs will offer this. Um, Babesia fish is also available. This fish, again, because it's genus level, can pick up Babesia as a genus and therefore multiple species, not just microti and duncani, but you know, occasionally there's going to be some other ones that are picked up. It is, like I said, a direct test that detects RNA. The interesting thing about RNA, you know, RNA does not stick around once the organism is killed because it's continually made by the organism, but then it's also continually degraded by the host. In fact, the half-life of RNA in the blood is measured in minutes. So unlike some people who say, oh, a positive PCR can mean, you know, like a mummy, it's a dead organism. Well, the Babesia fish, which is an RNA-based test in this laboratory, if it's positive, it means your organism was there and alive at the time the test was done. So that's a really important little tidbit to know. And again, it can detect these organisms hidden in biofilms. The PCR that's offered, again, it's a direct test. It's a DNA level test. And as, a, as with all of these at Igenix, it's designed to detect at a genus level. So you have a much broader spectrum of coverage. So the obvious conclusion from all that I've been telling you is that it's really often necessary, especially when you're starting with a new patient, to look for multiple pathogens. Um, because of the symptom overlap, it's often not possible to separate them out on clinical grounds. And for example, uh, as I explained very much before, symptoms of Lyme and relapsing fever, tick-borne relapsing fever can overlap to the point where you absolutely do not know one from the other just on clinical grounds. Now we know that Bartonella can cause things that we attribute to Lyme, for example, joint pain, fatigue, neurologic issues, and so forth. Likewise, babies, it can cause headaches, dizziness, fatigue, things that we attribute to Lyme. So again, on clinical grounds, it's sometimes very difficult to sort one out from the other. And like a lot of our patients, sometimes they have more than one of these things. They might have Lyme and relapsing fever and Bartonella and babesia, so you really have to rely on the lab. All of these can become chronic. Um, all of these can evade treatment. And all of these obviously can be missed if they're not tested for, not thought about. And again, the uh, conclusion is, you know, testing for multiple pathogens is going to maximize the diagnostic accuracy. You really want to think more than just Lyme Borrelia.
All right. So I talked about, you know, which types of organisms to look for and to be more broad in your thinking. But when it comes to the performance part of it, maximal accuracy is important. Obviously, you don't want a test that's got false positives, false negatives. So that's where the immunoblot comes in. Now, this is the, the genius of this test. The protein antigens that are used in this test are recombinant genetically engineered proteins. They're not proteins derived from lab strains. Now, let me explain this in more detail. When someone, when a lab is going to perform a test like a Western blot, how do they get this Western blot? Where do they get it from? How do they create it? Well, what they have to do is they have to take the organism that they're looking at, let's say a Lyme Borrelia, they have to grow it in culture to the point where they start to produce a lot of surface protein. Then the organisms are lysed. They're sonicated and broken up with sound waves into teeny weeny pieces. And by chromatography and other things, the antigens are separated out. And they're then used, um, put on immunoelectrophoresis to separate them out by molecular weight on the strip. And if you've ever remember what a Western blot looks like, you see a long, thin strip of paper, these horizontal black lines going across. And each one represents a protein antigen from the organism. But the problem is you have to, find, number one, find the organism you're looking for. Not all of these organisms can be gotten from a culture. They're not available from, you know, Lyme Culture USA laboratory. You have to find them. Not all of them are available. Number two, when you do find them, what Igenix found is that the commercial sources are often contaminated. They might have a number of different Borrelia in, and they say it's Borrelia burgdorferi, and they find Evzaliides in it. So that can make the Western blot less accurate. If the culture is very active, it makes a lot of protein, you can start getting very dense Western blots and perhaps false positives. It's a poorly grown culture, which is usually the norm. You know, there might not be enough bands, might be enough antigens, you can get some false negatives. Now, because you wait, you're basing this on antigens from broken up living organisms that are then put on a, a filter paper and spread out by electricity and so forth, the other things that will co-migrate, there can be viruses, other bacteria that will make proteins that look the same on a Western blot. Also, where these horizontal lines end up on a Western blot, these bands, um, that determines what their identification is. For example, if one goes up to the middle of the band or the middle of the piece of paper, it says, well, this is probably band 34, for example. Um, so in other words, where these things end up on the piece of paper, is the way they're identified. And that's very nonspecific and simple things in the laboratory like change of reagent concentration or temperature of the bath can actually change how these things look. So it makes the Western blot and tests based on um, culture-based antigens like IFAs too, it makes them less sensitive um, and also less specific. Now what an immune blot does, number one, they don't use cultured organisms. They use genetic reverse engineering. They'll take the organism, look at the genetics of it, find the gene that makes the surface protein. They'll amplify that gene. They'll put it into something like E. coli, for example, have that E. coli produce the Borrelia antigen, the specific one, the band 34, for example, um, and use that in large quantities. They'll, they'll purify it, and then they'll put it into the system. And what they do is they've, they'll do this for dozens and dozens of different protein antigens from each organism. And that means that number one, it's completely pure. It doesn't have any contaminants from you know, other bacteria, from other viruses, whatever. Um, so number one, it's completely pure. You don't have this culture problem. Number two, the amount that they put on their test systems is measured. It's actually printed on like you do a, a, a inkjet printer. So the quantity is exact. It's not based on how good or bad a culture is. And finally, where they spray it on the strip is a very specific location. So they know what is what. So they know that band 34 is band 34 and not something that might have migrated higher or lower based on the technicality of the test. So it's a very precise, you know, 21st century test that makes completely obsolete the Western blot, the ELISA, the IFA. And this makes it much more sensitive, much more specific. And as you've seen, able to detect a lot of different species that you just cannot do. Another example, I mean, if you're looking for eight different species and strains of, of Lyme Borrelia, you'd have to otherwise do eight IFAs or ELISAs and eight Western blots for confirmation if you really want to know what's going on. Here, this one immunoblot will do all of them. All right, so immunoblot, as I mentioned, is by far the best serologic test you can get. It makes everything else obsolete. The fish abse, um, as I mentioned, it uses specific RNA probes 
And studies have shown them to be orders of magnitude more sensitive than direct smears, for example, in Babesia. Babesia smear, standard blood smear that hospitals do, you have to have a good percentage of infection, at least half percent, one percent, two percent of the red cells infected. And here, I've heard researchers say this is probably 50 to 100 times more sensitive than that. You know, Igenix will never give you that statistic because there has to be, you know, FDA approved or whatever to do that. But um, we just know clinically that, and from my lab colleagues, that this is far more sensitive. Think about it. A regular blood smear, you have to stain it with H&E or one of the other simple stains and look and look and look for find a blue spot, which can be a platelet. I mean, it's hard to tell. Here, this is a specific RNA probe that fluoresces. So you use a black light, you darken the room, the thing lights up like neon. I mean, I've seen it myself. It's really pretty amazing. And because of that, and because it can detect organisms in biofilms, it has shown to outperform PCR. Now, when it comes to PCR, if you do a Lyme PCR at Igenix and you send serum and blood, they will do not one, but four PCRs. The, the genomic, uh, genetic material and plasma material, they'll do PCRs on, and they'll do whole blood and they'll do serum. So when you order an Igenix PCR, you actually have the option to get four different PCRs out of your one test. So for all these reasons, I mean, those of us who know about labs, this is why we use Igenix. Now I wanna show you the difference here. This is a study published years ago, 2007, comparing the sensitivity and specificity of the standard Lyme ELISA has been available you know, for decades. Get my mouse to work up, oh, here we go. So if you look at the sensitivity, I've got my arrow showing, what are here? 66%, 55%, 50%. Here's one a little bit better at 75%. Look at the other column. If you look at specificity here, it's lower for the, for the 75%. So in other words, with these types of tests, there's always a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. The reason is when these are developed, you have to run the test on a large number of patients, large number of controls, and look for statistically what's a cutoff. So uh, below a certain number is negative, between this number and that's borderline, another above a certain number is positive. And where you put those cutoffs determines the sensitivity and specificity. So if you wanna make a test much more sensitive, you run the risk of getting false positives and losing specificity. You say, all right, I don't want that. I want to be very, very specific. Um, I don't want to have any false positive. Then the sensitivity falls down. And these are perfect examples. Here are the ones with 100% specificity, 66%, 55, 50. The ones with higher sensitivity has a lower specificity. So the numbers vary a lot. This author um, gave a weighted average of 49%. May or may not be valid, but the point is that this is really very, very poor. And um, I don't know, you never use this kind of, or never accept this kind of lack of accuracy in a test for HIV or hepatitis, cancer, you never do that. But somehow this has become the standard in Lyme. It's what big labs use, it's what the CDC promotes. So go figure. Now look at the immunoblot results. Now it's a big table, a lot of numbers here, but I don't wanna go through the whole table. I wanna show you the very interesting thing that caught my eye. Go through the first column. These are samples provided to Igenix from the CDC itself early Lyme, convalescent early Lyme, then later stages. In early Lyme, we've always been taught the dogma that you don't even bother to do a serology when someone presents with an EM rash because it's too early to show it in the blood test. And you know, it takes time for the antibodies to develop and be detectable. And their data shows that. Here are two tier tests, um, early stage Lyme, 20% of the time it picks it up, 80% of the time a false negative. IgG is nothing. You put the two together, one or the other or both, 20% of the time you pick it up. So it's all right, you're supposed to not just do that. You're supposed to, if you can draw blood, you do an acute and convalescent, look for to change. Well, it goes from zero to 33% for IgG. IgM from 20 to 66, so you're still missing a third of your patients. Even if you put them together, you're still missing 20%. Now let's go down here to the immunoblot. Again, these are CDC samples. When you look at IgM and IgG together, they pick up 93 plus percent of early cases of Lyme disease. And you say, well, wait a minute now, this is, all right, how is that possible? Well, it's not that our bodies don't make antibodies early on. They do. It's just that in such low numbers that they're not detectable because of all the background. But because the immunoblot filters out that background with recombinant proteins, it can actually pick up these low-level antibodies. Now, never in the history of Lyme disease has there ever been a test that has a 93% sensitivity in picking up early Lyme disease. 
Now, how many times have you seen a patient who has a very nonspecific rash? Is it poison ivy? Is it a spider bite? I don't know what it is. Has it been scratched so much? I can't tell anymore. Or someone who comes in after hiking with a few days later with the so-called summer flu. And, you know, what is it? Do you do an acute and convalescent titer, you know, and wait six weeks to get the test and then the result and then the patient might be sick? Do you give antibiotics and cross your fingers and, and wait? Um, do you do nothing and see? Well, finally, we have a test that has a 93% chance of picking up a positive case of early Lyme at the point where even the CDC's own tests don't show it. So this is the big game changer. Never, ever before has this been possible. Now, because the turnaround time of an immobilite is about five working days, um, you know, it gives you the chance to say to the patient, look, within five days, five working days, we're going to know with 93% chance that's, that's accurate. Wait, now let's go back another way. Say, all right, all this positivity, there's got to be a trade-off, right? Well, look here. This is a data on specificity. In other words, how many false positives will they be? Now, these look at on the far left the samples. CDC's unknown set number one, CDC's unknowns number two, proficiency testing. This is supplied by CLIA and all the other um, agencies, autoimmune diseases, viral infections, people with syphilis. The immunoblot can be interpreted by Igenix's own criteria or the CDC's criteria. In any case, the specificity here at the worst is 96, 97%, 96.7. At best, it's 100%. So we'll go back to the other slide. This 93% pickup rate is at least 97% accurate in picking up a case of early Lyme disease. And it's at least 97 to 100% accurate in picking up a case of established Lyme disease. Nowhere else are you going to find the sensitivity. And this is not just CDC. This is all these other samples that were tested in a proficiency setting. So now I talked about the different types of organisms that are present and the fact that it's really important for us to recognize that and when appropriate, test for the different organisms. But we also talked about different numbers of testing te technologies. So what's available and when do you do what? You can think about them in two different groups. The direct tests, which look directly for the pathogen to be in the specimen, and the indirect tests, like antibodies or T-cell reactivity in the blood. So with the direct test, why would you do that? Well, not everybody has detectable antibodies. Sometimes their immune system is not up to snuff. Sometimes it's because they're early in the illness. Sometimes because they've had steroids and they won't get them. Sometimes it's because the antibodies are present, but they're bound in immune complexes, and that will keep them from being detected by serology testing. So for all these reasons, you may have to do a test that's direct, for example, a fish test or a PCR. And as Studi said earlier, you know, if you're talking about infants and, and young kids, they don't like it, their, their fingers stuck or their arm punctured. Um, so in that case, you can do direct testing on your own specimens. You can do antigen capture and you can also do PCR at Igenix. Um, and that's down here. PCR being a DNA test, you can do multiple sources, blood, spinal fluid, tissues. I've sent breast milk there. Um, you can do fish testing. This is on blood samples, urine, antigen capture, and urine PCR. Um, so those are the direct tests. With the indirect tests, um, again, that could be a B-cell-based test, like an immunoblot, or it could be a T-cell-based test, which is the IgX spot. It's an LE spot technology. So why would you use an indirect test? Well, first of all, sometimes, in fact, more times than not, the pathogens are not always found in the bloodstream. Um, Lyme Borrelia do transit through the blood, but only usually late in the afternoon and not every day of the week. Um, Bartonella, they're really tricky. They're stuck in biofilm. They're um, stuck in tissues. They might be in, embedded within a red cell. So they're not always available to be picked up circulating in the blood. So we might have to look for an indirect way of testing. And that's, again, the antibody and the T cell testing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll have a positive T cell and a negative B cell based test or vice versa. And that could be an indicator of immune deficiencies that otherwise you didn't think about or were otherwise not obvious with the patient. So doing a combination of tests, say direct tests and indirect tests, a B cell test and T cell test, not only can it help you identify pathogens, but it give you some background information on the health of the patient. An indirect tests, that's the immunoblot, the Western blot, IFA, ELISA, and those are all B cell based. And the T cell response test is the IgX spot. I'll give you an example. This is an older slide from 
um, before the immunoblot was available with Bartonella. But these are patients who were tested for Bartonella. They all didn't have Bartonella, but they were tested. And for example, the FISH test picked up some, the Western blot picked up more, um, the IGX-5 picked up some. So they picked up about half of the cases um, or half of the positives. Not everybody had this. This is just what they picked up. But the point here, though, is that some were positive on one test, but negative on another. And what I always did in my practice was do the Babesia test by FISH, PCR, and serology. Bartonella, likewise, I'd always do a FISH, Western blot, and some type of other, if I had it available. Um, and that's because sometimes one's positive, sometimes one's negative. But the thing to remember about this, and going back a couple of slides here, so with these new technologies, they're highly specific. So a positive is really a positive. Um, that's true for the immunoblot. That's definitely true for the genetic-based tests like PCR and FISH. Um, so if you have, let's say, a serology, a FISH, and a PCR, and one or two of the three is positive, the other one or two is negative, in this case, you would believe the positive because you might have a false negative, but you don't have a false positive. I know that question has come up many times. So now I've confused you a lot. There are different germs, different tests, different type of tests, different co-infections. I, wow, head is spinning. How do you figure this out? How do you set up your practice? How do you get your brain straight? Well, that's why Genix set up these things, what they call test panels. It's a, what you call is a logical grouping of testing to help increase the accuracy and completeness and also it saves money, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, it simplifies ordering tests. You don't have to go through this long list of, oh, do I have this, do I have that, et cetera. I'm gonna do panel number three or number whatever. Um, it also makes it really easy and quick to order something. And you know, in my mind, it's also a good memory jogger because I'll say, gee, what am I gonna order in this patient? So many things are going on. Say, oh, look at this panel. I should add Bartonell to it. I wasn't thinking about that. So it's a good memory jogger too. Now I'm gonna give you an example of two of them. One of the more popular ones is called LTP1, and basically it's Lyme and relapsing fever Borrelia, and it's by um, Emilia Blatt, both IgM and IgG. Interestingly, and very cleverly, they include an IFA in it. Not that IFA is really going to change much, but some insurance companies require two-tier testing. So the IFA is the first tier, you know, the CDC recognizes that as do insurance companies, and Emilia Blatt, they recognize as a more specific test, and that could be the second tier. So even if you don't want to do a two-tier test, this is included in the panel so you can get better insurance coverage. And you know what? You save $204.50, according to what I've seen. I figured that myself. Hopefully I'm right. But you save over $200 by doing a test panel. So not only do you get better information and more likely to have it covered by insurance, but you're also saving money for the patient. One of the most commonly ordered ones, one of the most popular ones, is their tick-borne disease panel. It has Lyme, relapsing fever, Babesia, the two different species of Babesia, the whole genus of Bartonella, HME, HDA, Rickettsia, you know, Rickettsia artyphi, includes serologies by IFA, includes immunoblots, includes PCR fish, serum, and whole blood. The whole thing together is very comprehensive. A lot of the different major players, a lot of different methodologies, all the good ones. And at the same time, it saves you over $1,300. So I really encourage you to look over the paperwork that you can find from Igenix and look at these panels and get used to them because it's really, really helpful to jog your brain, be very complete and save some money. Speaking of money, you know, thinking about an immunoblot. So, you know, immunoblot is kind of expensive, which it really is. But on the other hand, if you were to find a lab somewhere, which doesn't exist, but let's just pretend you can find a lab somewhere that'll do eight different Western blots to duplicate the one immunoblot, you can be paying a lot more money. So an immunoblot is actually a money saver, number one, because it's more complete. And number two, a better test in the long run is going to save money for everyone, for the patients, for the insurance companies, for everyone. So, you know, don't try and cheap out. Get a better test for your patients. You know, they deserve it. And so do you. Um, now, the immunoblots are available for Lyme, tick-borne relapsing fever, Bartonella, and also COVID-19. Now, if you don't know about the COVID immunoblot, that's a whole thing that's Absolutely fabulous. One day we have to talk about that. Now, finally, Igenix also offers this last test. They call it a broad coverage assay. It does use recombinant protein antigens, just like the immunoblot. Um, and it's available for Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever, but it's a very simplified stripped-down test meant to replace the ELISA. Just like the immunoblot replaces the Western blot, their broad coverage assay 
um, replaces the ELISA. You know, they call it a broad coverage because um, it does, just like the immunobot, look for all these different species. Um, it's just very much simplified. It doesn't separately report IgM and IgG, and it doesn't give you speech. It just says positive or negative, just like an ELISA would be positive or negative. And that's why it's less expensive and very simple. Now, if you have one that's positive, and you want to say, all right, what actually is going on? Is it Californiensis? Is it 297? What's going on? Then you would have to go back and then do an immunoblot just to get the more detailed information. But if money is an issue and you want to use this better technology, don't waste your time, money, and blood on the stupid ELISA. I mean, get yourself a broad coverage assay. Now, you know, this is another slide that's kind of obvious. A better test is important. If you use a bad test, an insensor test, you can have a lot of trouble. Think about all the trouble. I'm sure you've seen your patients who's, who've gone to 20, 30, 40 other doctors and finally come to you and they get someone who listens to them and does a good test. But all the seronegativity they've had in the past, misdiagnoses, incorrect diagnoses, patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms are told they're crazy, they should see a psychiatrist. Some are told, we don't know what you have, just live with your symptoms. Um, so seronegativity has caused a lot of patient heartache. But also, if a patient's seronegative, you may have a hard time getting coverage by the insurance company because they say, what's the positive proof that you have this? Even though we know it's a clinical diagnosis, they want something in black and white. And in some jurisdictions, you know, the medical boards are going to start paying you visits because they look for uh, you know, hard data. Um, you may not only have trouble from medical boards, the insurance companies may start uh, giving you trouble. Your peers to say, oh, that's a crazy Lyme doctor. Everyone comes to his office, has Lyme disease. Well, no, that's why you want a good test with solid uh, data behind it that's available to the public and to anyone who disputes the accuracy of hygienics. So again, as a good clinician, you want to use the most accurate testing available. And that's you know, what hygienics offers. So we're going to give you some examples. This is a, um, a Bartonella immunoblot. Um, on the left side, we'll just talk about it. Um, they give you what, how to interpret a positive test, how many bands you need. It talks about what species are going to be reported. If these species are not present, but some other species are present, you're not going to get a false negative. They're going to say it's a positive test for, uh, for Bartonella species. Um, we just can't tell which one it is. But if you see that, that's not a false positive. That's a true positive. You have to believe that. Now, look at this interesting test. Here's a patient who had a positive IgM. On the IgM, only hence they showed up. But on the IgG, I don't know if you can see it on the bottom, um, it showed up for three different species. So this person was co-infected and Hensley was an early case, it was just beginning. So this poor patient was exposed repeatedly to Bartonella and turns out, I found out the background, this was a, um, a worker in a, in a zoo, an animal worker in the zoo and ended up getting exposed. So basically when you get a result like this, it's very clear cut, easy to interpret, and a positive is really a positive. Here's one on a Babesia. Um, here's someone had a positive IFA, look at the top on the right, um, a borderline, there's only um, 20. They're tied to, um, you have to 40 or more to be active, less than 20, they don't know. There's a negative and in 20, it's indeterminate, so I don't know what it is. So we get to the more accurate tests, the fish um, and the, um, for looking for IFA and for, um, I'm sorry, for, for Babesia microti and for Duncani, you find that this patient actually was negative. So this was a false positive on that one. That's the value of doing multiple tests. And here's an actual Lyme immunoblot report. For IgM, this person was positive 23, 41, and 93. And the interpretation is simple, two or more bands, um, and it's positive. Even the CDC, two or more of these specific bands is a positive. In this case, the patient was positive both by I, uh, CDC standards and by hygienic standards. But again, hygienic criteria say, well, they're more lenient. Yeah, but they still have a specificity of 97 or a higher percent. So the rate of false positive, even with hygienic criteria, is very, very low. And again, you would believe a positive test, especially in someone who's got symptoms. So before I close, I got to remind you that you know, Igenix has always been a favorite lab of mine and many people, not just because the testing is good, but because the people, they're really nice. The personnel, when you call the phone, they're not just some secretary who looks at the wall and says, I don't know. There's someone who's been trained. They have the background. They have the ear of the scientists. So the customer service personnel, you can really rely on them. And they're honest. They say, you know what? I don't know that. I'm going to find out and tell you about it. 
So you can actually call the company and get the information very often. Likewise, the sales reps, they spend a lot of time in training. They've gone through the lab. They get car scientific articles. They've been constantly trained on what's going on and what's new. Um, and again, if they can't answer the question, they're going to get the answer for you and get back to you. Dr. Shah, who's in charge, is always very happy to help. There are times I've called her up and say, what is going on? <laughs> and she's helped me out a lot. Um, and the website, you know, go through it. There's a lot of reference material. There are patient stories and so forth, but there's also webinars, references. We even have now a symptom checker. And as you saw from earlier from Studi's presentation, they have examples of the um, order sheets. So you can look at the different panels that are available before you actually go out and order them. Likewise, you can order the test kits from there. So that's all. We are pretty low on time, but we have time for questions and chatting. So I think we can open it up. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Burscano. That was great. Uh, fantastic. You. And uh, it is the top of the hour, but we have a lot of good questions. And so maybe we'll take five or six of these questions. Um, so let me just uh, dive right into them real quick. This one is probably for Studi. Is there a certain day to mail a sample, like don't mail on Thursday or Friday? Um, only if you're doing the IGX spot, so Lyme or Bartonella IGX spot, then try and get it to us within two, two business days. We're open Monday through Friday. All other testing, you can mail any day, no problem. Okay. Here's a good one on the broad coverage assay. Does the broad coverage assay have good sensitivity for Lyme and TBRF, but does not speciate? Well, the answer to that is definitely yes, because it does use the same recombinant antigen protein technology as the immunoblot. Um, so the sensitivity um, and specificity is the same. It's just a stripped down, simple, less expensive test. Okay, great. Another one, since there are so many panels to choose from, do you offer clinician consultation to help us practitioners in choosing the most appropriate tests? Well, sure. I mean, that's what I've said in the last slide. You know, you can call the lab, you can talk to the sales reps, um, you can do, look up the resources on the Igenix website. And very often they end up having one of the physician consultants call you back. Could be me, could be Dr. Harris, could be others. Um, but yeah, they're always there to help. They don't, don't want you to be questioning things. They want you to feel confident in what you're doing and you learn from, you know, from us as much as we're, we can. I mean, we're happy to do that. Yeah, exactly. As Dr. B said, we're always on hand. We can answer pretty general basic questions and a little bit more technical. And then we can always transfer you to our lab manager or get in touch with Dr. Burskano to help. Okay. Another one here, if patients have other coexisting conditions and then test positive with Lyme, how do you focus on treatment, which to prioritize, especially if Lyme infection is dormant? Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's hard to answer directly because it depends on the patient and all the symptoms that go around the patient. Um, but, you know, when you have an accurate test, when I say accurate, I'm also talking a very specific test where you don't get false positives. If you find someone does have something that shouldn't be there, a pathogen that shouldn't be there, and you have a sick patient, you're obligated to try and help that patient because if someone doesn't get, you know, autonomic neuropathy for nothing, there's something in there driving it. And yes, you have to go through mass cell and detoxification and all the other things to try and get the people's lives strained out. But ultimately, you do have to get to the ultimate cause of this thing. And if you have a positive for tick-borne disease or any other infection that doesn't belong there, eventually when the patient's stable enough, you definitely have to get to it. So the testing is not an annoyance. It's a real help. Okay, just a, a couple more. Uh, given the controversies about the SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing, can you comment on the validity of PCR as a diagnostic test for tick-borne illnesses, um, the cycle threshold, et cetera? You know, I honestly don't know the cycle threshold that they have there. That's a question that Dr. Shaw could answer, but she's not on the call today. Um, but all I know is their, their data. Um, their specificity rate is 99 to 100. Well, it's just below 100 percent. It's 99 to 100 percent. Um, so a positive PCR is a positive. In terms of how sensitive is it? Well, that's not a function of the PCR test. It's a function of the pathogen, which may or may not be in the blood at the time you took it. Now, years ago, when I was working on culturing Borrelia, I worked with Alan McDonald. This is, <laughs> I hate to say how many years ago, but before the 90s, let's put it that way. 
Um, we found that the only time we could get a positive blood culture for Borrelia was late in the afternoon when patients had that like three or 4 p.m. energy sag and feeling flushed and low grade fever and had to lie down. If you did the test any other time of day, you would not get a positive blood culture. So I'm absolutely convinced the same is true for PCR. So a false negative PCR, at least in tick one illness, is not so much that it's a bad test, but it's a pathogen that may have intermittent presence in the blood or just not be in the blood that often. So it's different than that for, for example, COVID, where the pathogen is present in the swab and it's a matter of the technology of the testing. Here it's different. It has to do with the, with the pathogen. Okay, and here's one for, for Studi. Um, this is a question we get often. Is, I have difficulty finding labs to draw blood, even after looking on your website. Do you have any suggestions for lab draw in a remote area? Hi, um, so for remote areas, if your doctor doesn't do the blood draw or you're far away from your doctor's office and there's no labs in the area, you can try the local hospital. Sometimes um, they'll, they'll help, help you with the blood draw. Just let them know it's for an outside lab and you have a kit that provides all the return and shipping information. And also mobile phlebotomy services can work as well. So this is Dr. Been... Sorry? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to tell you my experience. Um, I live out in the country and I wanted to do some Agenix testing. Um, so I got the kit and my local hospital for a fee will draw the blood, spin it down and give it back to me. Then I just bring it over to FedEx Depot. Turns out they charge $7. Now, if I had a blood test done by them, let's say I had a CBC on, they wouldn't charge me anything. So you'd be surprised how amenable local hospitals are to doing that kind of thing. Now, LabCorp is not going to do it. They're not going to take blood from you and send to a competing lab, but a hospital, in my experience, has been very happy to do it and one, two, three, quick, and it's done. Okay, and last question. I, I know there's a few more, and we're any that we don't answer now, we're going to follow up after the call this week and, and provide answers, but I know it's, it's late, especially on the East Coast. Um, so the last question is, what are your opinions on treatment with antibiotics versus treatment with natural or herbal um, treatments? Well, um, I like to do both. Um, I find that it's very patient specific. Um, there's some patients who can't tolerate antibiotics well at all, but do tolerate the herbals. There's some who don't tolerate the botanicals at all and they have to use antibiotics. There's some who need both to get completely well. There's some who will start on antibiotics and then we'll taper off and stop and use the botanicals as maintenance. Um, it all depends on the patient, but I'm a believer in both. And there's hard data that's published that show that botanicals can actually suppress and kill the organisms. So I think there's a role for both. And I think to be a good practitioner, you need to learn about both. And a number of the different companies that make botanicals do offer seminars and webinars and so forth to help train you on that. And it's a matter of getting your feet wet. But I think they have a, there's a role for both. Fantastic. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for staying on the call. Thank you, Studi, and thank you, Dr. Buriscano. Again, uh, these slides as well as the presentation will be available on our website tomorrow if you want to go back and revisit the material. Um, if you have any other questions, you can call our 800 number or you can uh, email customer support. Um, and we'll get you in contact with scientists or uh, customer support or whoever you need to get in touch with. But anyway, thanks again. And until next time, have a good evening. Have a good evening, everyone. And Thank thanks you. again. <laughs>